Yeah. Cool. Oh, don't fucking swear now. <laughs> um, it's nice to know that. And now I'm slightly psyched out because I did oh, prepare sorry. for this hard. <laughs> I hope that I You're can gonna bring. You're going to be great. Is anyone else a bit rusty after two years of zero events? I know. But you've got Zoom down. Just about. It took me a good six minutes there. <laughs> it did. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So we have 16 people here. Crystal, what was our um, RSVP number? Do you know? 24, 25 probably. Okay. But, Let's um, get started and I'll, let, I'll keep an eye on the waiting list and let people okay. come late. Beautiful. Welcome, everybody. This is so exciting. This is our inaugural uh, workshop that we're kicking off here. And so that we really opened up to um, our community. So this is um, something around uh, development in our team that we really place a focus on. Uh, but we also, in addition to having our team on this call today, we open it up to our community and our clients. So um, there is a mix of people on this call. I'm not going to waste any time here because I want to hand this over to our very special guest today. Um, we have Laura Appleton joining us. And for those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting her, um, she is the Senior Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and Talent Management at Arcteric. She's coming up seven years there. That's unreal. Um, and just a quick note, someone needs to update their LinkedIn. Is that not what you're speaking about today, Laura? <laughs> that is not your title on LinkedIn. Um, she has been in recruiting for 15 years. She honestly is one of the best in the biz. She is a phenomenal talent sourcer, hence why she is here speaking about that today. Um, and I'm going to give you kind of a sense of some of her highlights in, in her career. So uh, Tessin actually met her at Lululemon and she recruited the head of innovation for Lululemon. Um, she does have agency experience as well. So she hired a Canadian Tony Sue at, Laura, am I saying this right? AKQA? What, what is that? All known questions answered. It's one of the, the best, I think, creative agencies okay. in the world. So that's a big hire. Big deal. Big, big, I still think about it. Big deal. Uh, you hired Lululemon's first color designer, Spencer Wyatt, Lululemon's first men's designer, Eric Knoll, really talented individuals. You hired the chief creative officer at Arcteryx. That's and a funny one. Of, pardon me? That's a good story, that one. I'm oh, sorry, yeah. Excited. You're going to have to tell us about that. Yeah. Time. <laughs> It'll be in my pivot slide later on. Okay. Okay. I like that. Um, and a couple of highlights. I love this, that you, I had asked you for some highlights from your career. And I love the examples you, you gave us. So one of them is hiring Thaisa. I, I'm not sure if she's on this call today. I, would, I hope she is. Um, while you were at Lululemon, she actually worked in the store. She was a West Forth educator, which is what Lululemon calls sales associates. And you saw her potential and hired her into our recruitment team. Um, and she is now a big daddy boss at The Gap. She's an incredible yeah. recruiter and you truly really saw her potential. So I love that that was a highlight of your career. Um, declining a VP. <laughs> It's on here. Uh, values were not there and you had to restart the search. So I love that as well. You, that's something that you love. <laughs> I can imagine you doing well declining a VP. Um, it's not me. It's you. Exactly. Right. So those are some really big highlights, just to give you some context of who Laura is and what she brings to the table and who Laura is to us, to Tess and I. Um, Laura actually was our boss, fun fact, at, at one point in time at Lululemon. Um, Laura is a part-time stand-up comedian, a master woodworker, a <laughs> loving partner and step-parent to two beautiful humans and one fur baby. And she is just one of our ultimate favorite people on this planet. So without further ado, here is the beautiful Miss Laura Elizabeth Appleton. Oh my goodness. For everybody, <laughs> that is not my middle name if you're trying to hack my bank account. <laughs> that is what Alicia likes to affectionately call me. Um, Alicia, thank you for that intro. I'm just going to play that on loop whenever I'm having a dark day. 
Um, what I didn't put on there, because I thought Alicia would be too shy to say it, is one of my proudest career highlights is Alicia and Tess being on my team. Mm. Note, both of them I didn't hire. My manager hired them and then put them on my team. So that was fun. We all worked out in the end. Uh, but I could not be prouder of how they've shown up in the world and what they are building at 1111. And I tell everybody about it. So for me to be Thank part you. of their of contribution today and um, see how incredibly talented and gifted these two business leaders are it just lights me right up so thank you laura i was actually going to bring that up why tess and i weren't on your highlight list. here they are i put them in my (laughs) slide deck um they're also a highlight for me with all their modeling and so here we go all right so uh strategic sourcing um it's funny because when crystal and i chatted about this i was like oh i've never called sourcing strategic uh it bloody is So I am a big fan of uh, interactivity. So I will ask people to raise their hands or use emotions, not emotions, reactions on uh, the old Zoom to give me a couple of um, clues. So I'm curious how many of you are in-house recruiters or talent acquisition and how many are an agency? So we'll go agency first, give us a little wave. Okay, and then, hello, hello, and then in-house. Okay, is that like 50 50? I'm terrible at math, but yeah, 50 50. Oh, good, because I've got stories for both sets of people. So this is wonderful. So, what I've put together is a uh, six key learnings on my journey so far. And I say so far because each year I learn something new, particularly with COVID. So, these six little learnings are broken down with some stories. And um, I think we have some time for QA at the end. But if there are any questions as we go through, I'm all over it. I love improv. So let's go for it. So learning number one, always, 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 always remember the fastest way to kill a culture is through recruitment. These very threatening words were ushered to me once upon a time by a uh, really defining leader in my career. And I love it. I tell every recruiter that I ever meet, um, that I hire or that I work with, that this is something, a principle or a lesson that I that I really stand by. What I love about it is really you're either solving a problem for that client or that company, or you are going to create it by hiring a problem. And so with an agency experience of mine, when I worked at Propel London, I was taught this lesson very quickly. I really wanted to impress my new uh, managing director. And she brought along a client that was looking for a web developer. And this is like early 2000s. I had no idea about web. So I got kind of sold down the river by a potential candidate who let me know that he was really great at everything that came to do web development. In my body, I felt like this guy's a bit of a wise guy. We'll call him Bill. Bill is a geezer. He can do everything. He invented everything. He possibly invented the internet. But what sounds good is his ability to charm anybody in the process. So I'm like, yep, yep, I've got, I've got the perfect candidate. He can do this, 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 and this. He'd do everything, actually. And he's within our range for our salary. So it should be just a slam dunk. So off he went. He interviewed, charmed the client. Client was thrilled. Fish bosh on a Friday. Deal done. Not even into the full day of his first day, we had a problem. Client called my managing director. Turns out Bill has no idea how to turn the computer on, let alone how to develop websites. And so here I am pulled into my MD's office. Laura, we have a problem. Bill is not actually capable of doing anything that he said he was capable of doing. You put him forward because you didn't do any due diligence. And now the client's asking for not only a refund from the client part, but also from the candidate part, which means you lose money, which means I lose money, which is a problem. Not to mention that we've just cost them whatever during their culture day where People are thinking, why have we hired this person onto the team? So I share that story with you because I've never, ever, ever forgotten it. And when I think of um, setting out in recruitment or even as I begin to recruit for Arteryx, building out another team, it's really crucial to understand the impact of those decisions that you're making in the sourcing part and then in the recruitment and into the process. Because as I like to say, you can't polish a turd. If you're starting off with the wrong candidate in the sourcing pool, it's going to end up not very pretty. Whereas if you start off with the right candidates in the pool, you're more likely to be successful. 
And then on the flip side, when I was in-house at Lulu, I used to remind Tess and Alicia, we're only as good as our last hire. And if you can't make eye contact with that hiring manager because you regret hiring the person you just put on their team, we're going to have a problem. And this happened to me once. We'll call her Melinda. Melinda was also very charming in the interview process. And uh, I fell for it, put her into um, a pretty substantial position. Uh, within her first two weeks, she had upset almost every most senior person on the product floor. And then her finale was to call out our chief product officer during uh, a massive merchandising meeting. She was asked to leave the room, then asked to leave the building. And I was summoned to explain how the heck did this happen? So if those two stories do not give you the shivers, I'm sure you have some too. Um, but let us all remember that the fastest way to kill a culture is through recruitment. So that candidate pool is so, so very important. So talking a candidate pool, building, whoopsie, building a muse. So building a muse is probably something that you are aware of on a design or a fashion side of things. In recruitment, possibly not. And this was a, uh, an exercise that I went through a long, long, long time ago, and it works, and I keep it with me. So if I'm sourcing or if I'm mentoring somebody in recruitment or if I'm talking uh, in a development opportunity like this, I love to bring this up because not everybody does it, and I think it's a real... Um, point of advantage for any recruiter to have it in their pocket. So when you get the job description and you've had the client intake, you build out your muse. And that is really easy with five W's. So number one, who are they? What are their purpose and their values? If you are recruiting, and I'm going to be cheeky here, for an outdoor company such as Arcterix, you probably want to be attracting and looking and talking to people that love the outdoors. If or and outdoors doesn't have to be extreme mountains. It can be dog walking like I do every day. If you are recruiting for um, a cigarette company or a vaping company, you're probably not going to be talking to people that go to ride cycle every morning. So your who is really understanding what is the purpose and the values of this person and does it match up to the company? Two, what? What are they up to? What is their experience? Is their LinkedIn up to date? Are they on mat leave? Are they on a sabbatical? Are they doing the job that you're hiring for now or have they done it in the past? And that's gonna shape your candidate pool for having people that can either go straight into the job, hit the ground running, which is what so many companies need right now, or is there a training, a ramp up time for them as well? That's gonna start positioning you for when you speak to the hiring manager, hey, we've got Johnny and Millie over here they're ready to go. And then you've got Emily. She's coming in a little lower on the salary because she's got development to do. But I'm confident she can do it in this role with the right mentorship or leadership. Does the business have time for this? Three, when? Did they just start a new job? Anybody getting hit up hard on LinkedIn at the moment? Yeah, everybody. Isn't it funny when you've just started a new job and you get two invites to talk about another new job? This is where we have to apply some emotional intelligence and common sense at the end of the day. When are they available? What are they doing today that has you have the confidence that they're going to be available to, to A, talk about a role and B, actually start a new role? And if they're the absolute unicorn, they tick every single box that your person wants for this person in this role, own that. Be in the message, hey, I saw you just started a new job two weeks ago. I do have an opportunity of a lifetime. I'm confident on X, Y, and W. Connecting them to that, having some vulnerability of, I know you just started, and this is probably going to sound wackadoodle, and here's why I'm messaging you, goes a really long way to build trust and rapport with the candidate, because everybody at the end of the day wants to be feeling seen, heard, and understood. Number four, where? So where have they been? What is the history of their roles? What's their education? What's their location? What's on their LinkedIn or social media that's not anything to do with the job but gives you confidence of, hey, they've been there, done that. This is what gives me an idea that they'll be great for this opportunity. And then where are they in their career? So if you're hiring a director role and they're a junior and you're putting them forward, probably not going to get taken very seriously by the hiring manager. They're a senior manager tipping into director. Awesome. If they're a VP of a massive company and you have a startup, 
they could come down to a, a direct level if that's exactly what they're looking for. But again, this is where we need to be really clear in our communication to them. I see this and I'm sharing this information so that we're putting choice back in the candidate's hands. And then the finale, number five of the W, why? For me, it's my most exciting part of recruiting. What is driving that change? So why have they applied for the role or why did they respond to your tickle on LinkedIn? Um, and what's happening for them that's really got them in a different mindset in order to go forward. So as we're in this great resignation that Bloomberg likes to tell us, I like to think of it as the great reset. We've had a, a bit of a drought where it's been a candidate's market. Now more than ever, companies need to be really clear on what their employee value proposition is, over communicate it. And it's our job as recruiters to be really clear on what that is and how that can set people up for success. I think we're going to see a bottomless pit when it comes to salaries. I was talking to Mercer about some compensation work we're doing. And I was like, 2021 data just seems out to lunch now after we're seeing X, Y, and Z going nuts. When are we going to see a correction? And they were somewhat confident that Q1, Q2, once budgets for relaxed for this year and new budgets are set for next year, that there'll be a, a settling down in terms of the wild compensations that we're seeing out there at the moment. Um, but at the same time, is that a reason for somebody wanting to leave? And if that is a why in terms of they're either feeling not getting paid enough, this is a new opportunity where they can get more. We know 20K is the answer to that. It's actually a golden rule, um, which I can't remember, but what the exact rule of it is, maybe that'll be the quiz at the end. So get Googling now, but 20K is usually the number that will turn any loyal employee to have a, ooh, what's over there? That looks shiny. So may that be something to hold in your beret. Okay, number three lesson is know your client. Make it your business to know their business. And this for me applies if you're in-house or client side um, in an agency. Your tools of our trade are job description, website, maybe Glassdoor. Don't get me going on that client intake meeting. Um, and then if you're an agency, I don't think there's any harm in stalking as much as you can that's within criminal guidelines and uh, safety and not too creepy. If you are showing up and you have no idea who the CEO is of the company or the history of the company or what it even sell, et cetera, et cetera, you just haven't done your business to earn that business. And that's something that my agency uh, back in the day shared with me, you need to be able to walk in like you're an employee. And if you do not do your homework to do that, we don't, we don't get paid. Um, we, don't, we have not earned their dollars to, to do what we need to be doing. So I'm a big fan of stalking. How this shows up for me in sourcing is if I'm looking at a role that I've never ever seen before, and I'm quite old, so there's titles out there that I'm like, what is that? And I have to ask my 16 year old, like a TikTok contributor. Um, then that's a real thing. Then I will make it my business to go on all over the internet to find out who are the top five competitors to this company, who are the up and coming companies in this sector that this company is potentially going to pull from or um, be having people pulled from and be able to talk to that confidently. It's not just about the candidate, the client's so crucial um, and get obsessed is a fun way of putting it in that in-house, my goal for my recruitment teams over the years has always been that the hiring manager would consider them for the next job on their team because they know how it works. They know what the roles are. They understand the business contribution. They're really at one with the team. That to me is success, that that recruiter has really studied, put the time and effort in and built relationships to be successful within that, uh, within that team. So knowing your client is just one-on-one -on -one and you can never, ever ever I think know enough and then ask them as well so this was a really good one I have a tendency to think that I just know things and if I start law explaining I know Alicia and Tess will be like shut up ask some questions so if you want to show them that you know it go in and show them that you know it and then have at least one thing underneath your your pocket or in your pocket rather that you can ask them that maybe not is not like, what do I not know about your business that I can't find online that's going to help me talk to this candidate to position your business as the choice for their next role versus any other company, et cetera. Same for candidates too. 
my favorite question. What is not on your resume that gives you the confidence you're qualified for this role? I love that one. More on that later. So our next lesson, remember that you should always value everyone's time. I went on a real rant at a Disrupt HR, I think like three or four years ago, I forget now, about time. And we are never gonna get those last six minutes back unless you believe in something that I don't know. And for me, this is so important to, to value the currency of time and understand the exchange of energy that goes behind things. So for me, if I'm hearing that a candidate has been ghosted, or if I am ghosted as a candidate, it's just horrifying. Somebody's gone to all the effort to get their resume, interviews, cover letter, research completed, and then to just be dropped. It's one thing in the dating scene, but in recruitment, which I have it sometimes referred to as a dating game, I think we have a massive responsibility to put the candidate's experience first and foremost, and the clients. And Vancouver in particular is a very, very tiny village. And so there are recruitment agencies that I don't work with because uh, they have a reputation of ghosting or just forgetting about candidates and clients. And so without sounding threatening, Remember, everybody's got feelings and everybody put in some effort at times. So if it's just a one line of back, hey, got your application, I'll loop back. That's magic. Once upon a time at Lulu, I actually committed to the four and a half years or three and a half years responding to every applicant. It was nuts. And I'm so stubborn. I'd set the goal and I did it. I would give them feedback if I could. I would point them to other companies, whatever was better for their resume. I'm not suggesting doing that because it turns out you don't have enough time to do that. And I have some hobbies now, but I would suggest being able to give people really clear, distinctive feedback um, wherever possible in the job description. So simple line is only candidates who meet the description or requirements above will be contacted, et cetera, et cetera. And if they can't figure that out, you've probably dodged a bullet. Um, and then what I would say as well here is, when you are sending your sourcing list to your client, whether it's direct to the hiring manager or to your recruiter, quality, not quantity, is king. So I've worked in roles where I had to produce 100 leads to get to four interviews to get to one hire. At Lulu, I got down to, because I had such high trust for my hiring managers, I got down to just presenting one or two candidates and we'd make a hire. That was after years of, of mastery. And now even at Arcterix, it's how many, how many people do we know are actually doing the role according to LinkedIn and other data points? And how are we checking in on our biases to ensure that we are not just looking in one area? How are we open to, um, or sorry, how are we educating ourselves to, to know if we are missing any groups that we would traditionally be looking over or haven't been um, at the forefront of our places that we search? So it takes discipline, it takes courage, I think, to be really clear on how many candidates you're going to be sourcing, because LinkedIn, everybody can do everything according to their LinkedIn profile at some point. And particularly with an with a, um, agency, I think they're already like, we needed this role yesterday. If you're sending over a list that's 200 names, it might make you look like you've been a rock star but they don't have time to read it. So you better make sure your top three picks are clear at the top, like prioritize it and say why number one is number one. And don't be shy to point, to have a point of view as to what's going on with who you've selected. And then in-house, again, I think it's great to be able to show a, a sourcing tracker. And then I want to talk about the top five. And then I want to talk about the two wild cards that I'm throwing in here as well. It's that executive summary that's saving time and energy, and it positions you as that expert to be able to say to that client or hiring manager, here's what I'm advising here, here's my guidance. Then you do get the one person that does wanna go through every single candidate. So make sure your sourcing tracker is attractive. Do not put things in the notes that could be questionable. And if somebody isn't complete um, in their profile, don't add it. Because if their quality of their LinkedIn, such as mine right now, inaccurate titles, uh, is not there. You don't want that to look, um, well, my recommendation is not adding that person in because that's going to look like um, 
they don't care. So then you've added them in and, and they're not clear. Same as when somebody sends you a cover letter and it's got the wrong company name on. You are well within your rights to email them back and say, whoop, you made a whoopsie. Please, can you update the cover letter before I send this on to the client? So that is time. And then number five, always be sourcing. Secret source. I also wanted to say but at least once in this development workshop. So for me, um, has anybody ever hit their limit for searching on LinkedIn? Rah. Yeah, perfect. Oh, yeah. Some nodding, nodding. And Natalie, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I found that um, as well with one particular job that I really didn't enjoy and I needed to mine LinkedIn every day. And LinkedIn says stop and you have to have a timeout for a little bit, go watch some Netflix, come back. So for me, the way to get around that was I found a, a link on, not a link, rather a hack. I would go and see who had viewed my profile. And then I started doing this almost every day. So I would go look who's viewed my profile and then I would hit connect. And it didn't seem to matter how many connections there were away, LinkedIn would let me connect with them. And so that is passively building my network. They're generally in and out of different industries and some really random people at times that I went to school with. That's always fun. But my point here is you don't always have to be like up against the clock to be doing your best work. Some of your best work you may do accidentally slightly hungover on a Saturday. Oh, who's looked at my LinkedIn? Add them on a contact. Because when that client brief drops or when your in-house uh, hiring manager's like, shit, we have to hire 17 people tomorrow, this is where it's going to save your butt. Because that passive sourcing pool opens up so many different connections outside of your current one connections. And that's where you start finding the gold. And so being able to build that, I would say, is one of the most important lessons. A, it's not as stressful. B, you never know where it opens up. And then C, when you either move to a new client or you move to a new company, that lovely little LinkedIn database is still yours. That's your little black book. And that can be a massive point of difference for recruiters when they're walking into an interview where, you know, let's say there's seven other recruiters. And I'll use my own story. When I was being, um, when I was interviewing at Arterix, there was a real development and investment in the product side of the business, design and merch. And I was able to confidently say, knowing that the other person who I'd stalked on LinkedIn had no product experience. And there I was, a little bit of jumped up shit. Here's what you get with me, X, Y, and Z. And like, I think it was 15,000 or something ridiculous. LinkedIn, 70% of them are product merch and developers from around the world, global apparel companies. And now we go. So always be sourcing. Number one, it will save your butt and it is a secret source. And then lay down the sword. This is Mining Crystal's favorite saying. These were the wise words given to me by my hairdresser two weeks ago. But I think I've been trying to do it for longer. So there will always be a surprise in every search. And lay down the sword, I think, or learn to love the pivot are two of the smartest things that I am working on this year. So the client is not always right, but they are paying you. And the candidate is not always right and they are helping you get paid. And the hiring manager is not always right. And you have to work with them and see them at the Christmas party. And so where do you fall? Often in a bit of a conflict. Client may want to pay less. Candidate may want more. Client may want less experience after you just spent six weeks looking for somebody with an MBA. Um, the candidate might surprise you that they've got two other offers the day of their final interview with the client. Here's the thing, we've all been there, they're fun, and put like an enormous amount of pressure on you to get over the finish line. And then how do you say that to the client without putting that person under the bus for integrity? Still working on it. So what I have really learned in this lesson is it's people will forget the words you use, people will forget the people you place, people will forget the work you do. They won't forget how you made them feel. And there's a far more eloquent um, my, my, uh uh ugh, oh gosh i'm forgetting her name hi angelou angelou yes, yes. <laughs> Haley norwood for the win nice to see you um so the way better quote but that's my wee little quote 
And it really comes down to be nice. So when you get a surprise, take a breath. Hopefully you've all done some meditation with Tesla and really respond to what's being said. So for me, um, in the olden days, if somebody pulled a surprise, I may have been a bit of an asshole. And Tess and Alicia have multiple stories of that. Now, my practice is to be kind and nice and learn what did I not do in the process for this person to bring forward the full story, aka, oh, I already had two offers in my back pocket, or for the client to have not told me a really important part of the job description or where the business is going because I wasn't listening and they didn't think I cared or I didn't ask enough questions. And so laying down the sword is really, for me, you are not always right. You can do all the research in the world. It's about creating a safety, a psychological safety with the candidate and a psychological safety with the client to give you all the goods so that you are set up for success. Because if you have all the facts, then you're able to do your best work. If you're flying blind, you are kind of winging it and you just hope it works out and there will be more surprises. Why is this happening? So for me, it is critical, particularly at this moment, as our businesses are moving at lightning speed. So our Terex, we're in a high growth stage right now. Uh, I hired just recently a senior business partner to join us on our retail side. When we started the search, we were looking for a regular business partner. It took so long to find the right person that then we had grown actually six doors. So now our ratio for support was gone and now we needed a senior business partner. And that was all in the space of seven weeks. So if I had have just gone at it with the sword, God damn it, no, we're only hiring business partners. That's what the job description was. Then that wouldn't have helped anyone put the business at risk. Whereas if we can take a step back, have a breather, have a cup of tea, walk the dog, come back. Okay, so here's what we've learned and this is how we're gonna need to pivot. Who do we need to communicate with? And how do we make that happen? And be nice, bottom line. Nobody ever forgets that. And that is the six we lessons of my journey so far. Back to you, Alicia. Beautiful. Thank you, Laura Appleton. You really spilled the secret sauce there. Uh -oh. <laughs> the Laura Appleton secret sauce. That was so great. Thank you for being so generous uh, with us and, and looping us into your process. There were some really good um, nuggets in there. So we're just going to open it up to questions, come off mute. If you're shy, write in the chat box, but we would love to see you and ask a question or else Laura's going to start telling stories, which is also going to be very entertaining. <laughs> Like our first work trip, trip Alicia? Oh my God. <laughs> Apples, do you want to bring the presentation down so you can see everyone and then we can see everyone's beautiful oh, face? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'm new at this. There we go. And you're welcome to just jump off mute and ask your question, or you can put it in the chat box and one of us will read it out for you. Okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> Um, I have a question I, that was great, by the way, and super helpful um, around DEI strategy and, and kind of how um, that's evolved into your sourcing strategies now, especially as, you know, companies kind of have that at the, at the forefront of, of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. The great, great, great question. And I think um, the there's tactical pieces that I've done. And then there's just a fundamental belief that this is a journey that I'm on, acknowledging my white privilege and understanding and learning something every day. So first and foremost, I would say, I don't think I'm at a destination. I think I'm on the journey and really committed to it. And then from a tactical point of view, I had the privilege to go through four different um, unconscious bias workshops at Arterix. We have non sorry unconscious bias question built into our interview process at our Terex as well and then all of our hiring managers go through a training around unconscious bias so there's really tactical granular pieces that we've developed as a muscle and then i think it's really having a awareness of the privilege that i have and so i've worked at companies where we talked about the law of attraction and the law of attraction only attracts what you are. 
And if your pool is very limited and everybody looks the same, it's what you continue to, to develop. And so we've tested blind resumes, we've tested targeted recruitment. Um, I fundamentally believe it's about the right person at the right time for the right role. And at the same time, I understand not everybody has the same opportunities to, to be enabled to be in the right role at the right time. So I think there's lots of work to be done at a foundational community and education level before adults even become adults. So those kids can see themselves at companies and kids can see themselves in roles that they don't see themselves in today because the, the visibility and the representation is not there. So a very small thing we do right now as we turn our social media and have them for a while, um, pride colors, the flag, and there was quite a backlash, I think it was this year, and I think I even chatted with Tess about it, that um, some, of the, some, of our, uh, some of my queer family, I'm queer, if you did not know, it's on LinkedIn. Actually, no, it's not, I'm kidding. Um, that um, we, were, we were, I think it's pride washing is the term. I had to Google it, because I was like, oh, what's this? Again, feeling quite old this year. And... Some of our folk in our charics were upset about it. And so sat down, had a chat. And I said, you know, the beginning of this, when we were all figuring out, oh, we're a bit different from everyone else. You want to look to somewhere where you're safe, where you can bring your whole self to work. And that's really my purpose in my work is to create platforms for the people to perform at their best because they can bring their whole self to work, whatever that looks like, and be welcomed at whatever part of their journey they're on in that development. And for me, the pride flags for our social media, it's a signal. Hey, we see you, you're safe here and you are so welcome to come and work here. Once you get someone in the door, that's diversity. Inclusivity is that they can now see themselves in the CEO suite or they can see themselves um, sharing their pronouns openly or they can see themselves using a toilet that's um, transgender. So, and by that, I mean using a toilet, but the signage says everybody welcome on the toilet, not just the binary female male. So there's a lot of there's a lot in there. And I think we have thankfully started the journey that once you can see your biases, you can't unsee them again. And it takes so much work to see where those biases are. Like I had so many biases around gay from my upbringing and from society in the UK that it was wrong. So then you start to look at where have you repressed or where have you not fully been able to bring your whole self to work because you've just felt that you can't. That was a long answer there. Hopefully I landed something, Alyssa. Thank you for that. No, no, that's really great insight. And I think it's such a good point that, you know, it, it's really a journey and, and not a destination. I think that, you know, all these small steps are going to are going to get somewhere. It's, it's, you know, kind of building that foundation. And so I think, yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. You're welcome. And I think as well, if like if you're talking to a candidate and they're like, oh, like I'm never going to go work at that place. I've heard it's a bro's locker room. Then, you know, you can bring forward, well, actually, this is an initiative they're doing or mm -hmm. having that clarity with the client. I'm getting a lot of feedback about what type of culture you have. Is it true? And then not being afraid to be like, we're not working together anymore or okay, help me understand more so that I can really be an ambassador for change here. Because as we're seeing, everybody needs DNI. Like it's going to take a massive effort of us, I think, uh, as in corporate companies, before we see government implement things. And I'll leave that there because this is being recorded and I don't want to get in trouble. Hi, hi, Laura. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. And thanks for the presentation, Laura. It's great. Um, I had a question and maybe more of uh, an opinion, but what is your view when it comes to, you know, reference checks in the process um, of the sourcing process? And how would maybe like a just okay reference check, um, you know, impact your decision maybe in the process? And how do you kind of frame it with the hiring manager reem you are fucking brilliant this would be this is something that i've just totally forgotten i'm like oh this is one of my secrets oh sorry you have a baby and i just swore oh she's sleeping it's all she doesn't okay. understand yet yeah okay okay future recruiter right there 
So um, I'm a firm believer in reference checks. I really love doing them. Here's the reason why. One, if somebody can't give you reference checks, something's not complete, whole and complete in their life. And we've all left, let's have a show of hands. We've all left some company at some point being like, F you, I'm going to burn you down. Nope, just me. Okay. Oh yeah, here we go. There we go. Truth corner. Um, and that's fine. Like we all have feelings and emotions and I think it's very positive to express them. Then you got to do go do clean up aisle nine. And I had a very famous exit within my four friends on this call from Lulu where uh, my exit interview was actually a walk offsite, not recorded. And it was a bit dramatic. Now I let it go. I let it go. I let it go. And then I was going to Arcterix and I needed a reference from Lulu. So I called up my old manager and I apologized. I called up the VP of HR at the time who had since left and apologized and really just cleared it. I didn't ask them for a reference. I just cleared like and owned my shit and let them know I'd done a bit of therapy. It was good. So that really for me just reset because I'm a firm believer how you leave one company is how you start the next company. Same in your love life. How you leave one is how you start the next and you got to clean up when you're ready and that's going to support your reference check so um i ended up actually giving my old manager from lulu as a reference check because she called me the next day and was just so shocked that i called and apologized and was like what are you up to i'm like oh i'm in the process of arteric she's like can i help i'm like probably gonna need a reference check yeah what do you think about that and she was really clear with my old leader like we had some run-ins and the great thing, quote, great thing about Laura Afton, she'll own it. And I trust that she's learned and she's going to do something different in the future. So reference checks for me are crucial. Second thing about reference checks, you never know who you're going to recruit out of them. So there's a phenomenal young man called Joseph Granato. And he was a reference check for a creative director, no, a graphic designer at Lulu. And we just hit it off. It was like we were ex-lovers, but we weren't. And he was like, can I take you for lunch? I was like, yeah. So we went for lunch, came back, told my boss then at Lulu, this is the future of Lululemon. We hired him and he went on to be the VP of something important that I'm forgetting. And now he's over at Arcterix as our VP of Business Excellence. So referencing is actually a great sourcing tool. You never know what you're gonna get. You get to build a rapport. You get to showcase your business. Like you get to be the ambassador of what's going on. And then to answer, if you get an okay reference check, depending on which BC, sorry, no, depending on which province you're in, which country you're in, and how cheeky you're feeling off the record, I'm a big prober. So if somebody's like, yes, I can confirm that Laura Appleton worked between these dates and she is no longer an employer at this company. Did you hang out with Laura at all? Nope. Did Laura do anything fun? Nope then just, you know, drift the conversation a little bit and see what's there. And I have actually had the candidate conversations where I've said I completed two out of three of the references, two were awesome, one was not, what, what gives? And again, that goes back to that lesson of respecting time and um, being really honest and clear with people in your communication and building that psychological safety. Because I forget which movie it was, the truth always comes out. I think it was some shitty horror story. Yeah, Tess is agreeing. The truth does always come out. And so it's way better to get it from that candidate and like even share a, a vulnerable story of your own where you were a dickhead and you're like, I fixed it, I solved it and what have you. Otherwise it's on you if you're an agency recruiter if it pops out during probation or worse, if you're in-house and you hire that person and you have to see them at the Christmas party and they're swinging from the chandelier and shouting things could have avoided that on that Chris, on that reference check and that's a true story that's what happened with Alicia Adams <laughs> I kid but Reem thank oh, you that's a wonderful question sharing all our secrets no thank you Laura that was awesome and uh, the way you phrase it is um that potential reference person that you check could be like a potential candidate like that's a great way to look at it and I wouldn't even have thought of that so yeah, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Sorry about the curse as well. <laughs> no 
Hi, Laura. My name's Jess. I just wanted to thank you first and foremost. This has been so, so good. Um, I just want to know from you, because it seems like you have a ton of great stories. What search are you most proud of uh, and why? Oh, thanks, Jess. Great to see you too as well. <laughs> um, what search am I most proud of? You know, I think it could be the creative um, officer at Arterix because that took, um, without giving away too much secret source, that took a lot of psychological safety on both parts of the hiring manager, our old president, the candidate, and me. I had been looking for a creative director. And that's a tricky spot in apparel because we're a, um, we're designed, if you don't know what Terex, and I'm Laura explaining now, it's very technical product. So you really want an industrial mindset versus a fashion designer. And if you can get the two, oh, money. And there's like seven people in the world that do it. So Reem, if you want your child to be wildly successful, get them on the pattern making and construction and functional fashion uh, or recruiting. And the creative director search was just drawing blanks. And there was like one candidate that I was just smitten like a kitten with. And I was like, uh, like I'd hang out with her all day, but I don't think she's going to take the business to the next level. And we'd just been bought um, by a consortium. And it was very clear that we now had a new roadmap in terms of our growth for the business. And our product line was rad and it needed to go somewhere else. And we needed to attract um, Drake, turns out. Kidding. He just wore our product. We didn't talk to him about it, but it was great. My kids now wear it because Drake wears it. So that's good. Um, but what it took was for me to be like, lay down the sword. Hey, we're drawing blanks here. We've got this great person. Um, what do we need to do? And it turned into a, a, a referral came through. And the candidate was like, I really want to talk to you. And I don't think this level is the level that I'm at or the level that the business needs to go to. If this was me 10 years ago, I'd be like, uh -uh, get out of here. It's not what's posted. But we've since embraced, always pivot. So we pivoted, set up interviews, and she's phenomenal. So she joined us instead of creative director as VP of design. And then now is our creative um, chief, our first chief creative officer. So I can't really say that I found her, but I can say that I created space for the real conversation to occur and then for the business to pivot as the business needed to. So that's something I'm really chuffed with um, in terms of legacy at Arterix. And then anytime somebody pops up and they're like, I think I want to do recruitment, which was Ty Easy at, or Taisa at um, West Forth. Sometimes you've got to take the time to step back and have a chat with somebody about their development to set them up for success as to where they want to go. And I couldn't be prouder of where, where Ty is today. Like she's probably making triple what I'm making. She's a gap. She's phenomenal global, global recruiter. And um, that wasn't even a search. Like we needed somebody on our team. And my girlfriend at the time worked with Ty and was like, can you just meet with her? And I was like, sure. And I was like, oh no, yeah, she's got potential. And then she went on our team, caused chaos, closed a record number of roles and was fantastic. So that's another highlight. Really, really good. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I can't believe no one's asking who was my favorite, Tess or Alicia. Like, what's wrong with you people? Stop being so Canadian. You can have a guess. I, I have one. Yes, Melanie. Okay, of course, I always have questions. Um, so just your opinion, and I know, you know, you're coming mainly from in-house and I've been there too. It's a very interesting um, time to be a recruiter and a candidate right now. And I mean, let's face it, candidates are being, we don't even know how many in-mails they're getting. Um, which is a whole other story. Um, I actually just had a situation today where I reached out to someone for a client and don't think she's actually going to be that great for various reasons. She's fantastic, but not great for the role and the level. Um, what's your approach with, you know, that kind of approach where you're sourcing, you're, you know, approaching them for a role and then you have to turn them down. What, what level would you do it? And just in general, like, what are your thoughts around, you know, we're approaching these people, but they're not always going to 
actually be fits or have the experience we're looking for. Yeah. I love that question, Melanie, because it's so important. Like as much fun as it is to close a role, Mm -hmm. it's our responsibility to be able to close a person that's not Mm -hmm. going into the role. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, again, it's not the work you do. It's how you make people feel in that. And call me odd. I really enjoy breaking up with people because in the breakup is the learning. Mm -hmm. And in the learning is what's going to really set them on the path that they're meant to be going on. Mm-hmm. And I've had some really big breakup chats with me where I've been applying for a job and um, one person actually laughed at me and was like, no, like you cannot do this job. And I'd be like, why? I have a confidence bias. I discovered mm-hmm. overconfidence bias. Oh, I can do that. Mm-hmm. Turns out you can't do everything. Spoiler alert. So for me, it's a phone call at the very least mm-hmm. because so much is lost in tone and mm-hmm. LinkedIn or, or email sure. and just set it up. Hey, I'm going to be sharing with you some feedback as to why we're not moving forward with you at this Mm -hmm. point. Are Mm -hmm. you ready to hear that now? Mm -hmm. And that's a really key question for me because if they are seven tequilas in or dealing with a breakup or their Mm -hmm. dog just got skunked, that happened to me on Monday, they're not in the space to do it. And they need to have the space. Like we talked about boundaries earlier on, they Mm -hmm. need to be in a space to receive it. Mm -hmm. because if they're not and you go full frontal it's probably going to be ugly Mm -hmm. and I've been Mm -hmm. there too that's not fun so are they ready to receive it Mm -hmm. keep it really clear and not personal Mm -hmm. and objective really Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day I'm a firm believer we're here to serve the business Mm -hmm. and if we make Mm -hmm. friends awesome yeah but we're in a business that's usually for profit and so the business needs the most important Mm-hmm. and uh, there was one particular recruit I remember a couple of years ago where this person internally was like just I'm doing this job already it's one of my favorite lines I'm like okay yeah. walk me through exactly what you're doing already turns out they weren't already doing the job mm-hmm. and then I was able to educate them here's what we're looking for because mm-hmm. this is what the business needs are mm-hmm. x y and z mm-hmm. and that's again through learning the hard way for mm-hmm. myself where mm-hmm. Um, somebody sent me down once and was really clear if so if you're clear you're kind and objective yeah I think you will be shocked at how many people say thank you eventually mm-hmm. some people say thank you same day same call mm-hmm. others might take six years but whatever mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's not personal For sure. yeah thanks and I think thank it all you. depends on when and um I think I thought that she would be moving on and after an hour long pretty tough conversation on my end I was like "Mm -mm, she's not so it's just kind of going back and saying after reviewing right so yeah our conversation but you know I think that people appreciate it sooner rather than later as well bingo yeah Mm -hmm. and even like on a Friday like if you know someone's not going forward yeah I think as soon as you know like be in action Mm -hmm. we used to have a thing at Lulu called do it now do it now Mm. and it's so important because you never know they might have another offer that you don't know about yet or Mm -hmm. they might not be feeling it and then you bring it forward like oh thank goodness because I've actually just gotten 10k raise and I don't want to move anymore perfect on to the next one got any referrals so thanks you're welcome So they were both my favorites for obvious reasons. I wasn't able to choose one, Uh, but Tess did make really good cookies. And Alicia wants maybe wear lipstick, so they balance. You told me not to make cookies, by the way. Yeah, I think I did, yeah. Part of my onboarding. (laughs) I've changed since, love cookies. We just have a few minutes left. Anybody else here have a burning question? Anything's on the table. Whoa, it's that time? Life, dogs, children, marriage. (laughs) Let's open it up. (laughs) (laughs) Why not? Let's go. Oh, hence of thinking. Oh, got oh, one. Raps, this is dangerous. Yeah, question. <laughs> um, what do you think, I guess, like right now, what do you think makes a great recruiter versus a good recruiter? Ooh. 
Good one. Right now, Raf, I think a great recruiter is applying all six lessons shared by Laura Appleton. <laughs> Jokes aside, I think a, a recruiter that's got drive or hustle, whatever you call it, it is a tough, tough market out there right now. So a candidate um, driven market puts up the biggest challenges for you in terms of owning that relationship and owning the, the client relationship. So your ability to build rapport from the very first LinkedIn message. So we talk about great leaders are great leaders because they build followership. They have people following them wherever they go. I think for a recruiter to build loyalty is absolutely like it's going to be your secret sauce because it's just like buying a house. Everyone's a real estate agent. From recruitment, everybody's got something that's shiny that could potentially pull your candidate away. And so building that loyalty is like, being transparent from the offset of I know you're probably getting 19 messages an hour and I want to work with you do you want to work with me here's our terms of agreements here's our guidelines for how this is going to be successful if it's not working you tell me and I'll tell you and then off we go I think a sense of humor is fundamentally critical because things are going to surprise you and pivot and you need to have a good giggle about it and then I think your knowledge of either their role or the industry that you are recruiting in makes you fantastic. Because the amount of LinkedIn messages that I get from recruiters about project management or IS, because there's random keywords in my LinkedIn that ping up, I'm like, did you even look at what I'm doing? So that attention to detail, I think, again, it's not what work you do, it's how you make people feel. So in your first message, if you're like, I see X, Y, and Z, and it's all relevant, boom, bada bing. They know that you care and you're paying attention. And obviously, if you work for 1111, that is top <laughs> recruitment right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I jump in with one quick question? Um, I'm hoping it's quick. Um, how are you finding navigating all of these new fancy makeshift titles on people's LinkedIn that like aren't really related to anything? <laughs> Great question, Leah. I would say I'm not navigating it without a gin and tonic. <laughs> and I think it's, it's extra legwork is what it is. You're going to have to take what, what I've been doing is taking the title Boolean search or Google search it and then find what is the, what it was originally was or what it was the original intent was, and then go from there or having the humility to ping them and be like, I've never heard of that. Can you tell me what it is? And then see if that opens the door for some giggles. But yeah, if we could get formal titles, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Once at Lulu, we changed our names from recruiters to talent attraction ninjas mm. none of us did karate i blocked that out <laughs> oh it was a nightmare people were like why have you got ninja in your title I'm like, i couldn't tell you i don't know <laughs> yeah, it's not helping no wonder i didn't get headhunted by the ritz yet. <laughs> there's still time you're welcome thanks leah there's still time cheeky <laughs> All right, we're at 12.58 here. I think that's a wrap. Beautiful, wonderful work, Laura Appleton, as always. Thank you so, so much. That was really, really full of lots of information. Um, and uh, thank you to everybody else who joined us here today. We would love your thoughts and feedback on um, how this was for you, the format, and any ideas for another workshop are definitely welcome. Yes, thank you, Crystal, Tess, and Alicia. And great to meet everybody and lovely to see your faces and good luck out there. Go get them. <laughs> Go get them. We need it. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Take care.